Well, um, I would say that uh, um, sexuality, uh, when I was growing up in Ghana, wasn't a form of identity, gay sexuality, because there just wasn't, uh, there wasn't a public discourse, there weren't words for, for this. I went to an English boarding school, a boys' school, so I pretty quickly acquired, <laughs> acquired the words. Uh, and so I had a sort of language for talking to myself uh, and maybe to some friends in England about my, um, the discovery uh, that my own or, uh, sexual orientation was, was, that my own sexual desires were directed towards my own sex and not towards the, the women. But, um, but, the, but that wasn't something that, I mean, if I'd sort of, as it were, worn a t-shirt saying I was gay when I was 15 in, in Ghana, or, um, people would have had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, th that's changed. I mean, there is now, uh, there are now gay organizations and, and gay movements in, in Ghana, and, and while the government has, on the whole, moved in a bad direction in response to that, um, I would say there isn't a huge sort of social consensus on the badness of homosexuality. There's still just a lot of people who haven't thought about it very much, and so they will take a view. If, if you give them a view, if you give them the evangelical view, they'll take that, but it's not because they're deeply committed to it. My, my, my father uh, is famous in my family that when my father was asked about this, he said, um, he said, well, I can see why you would have sex with a man because sex is pleasurable. What I can't see is why you wouldn't want to have sex with women. <laughs> so again, this is a different way, this is a different sort of cultural context for thinking about sexuality. For, for many people in Ghana today, I think, Gay men are men who don't want to have sex with women. It's not what they do want to do that's interesting about them. It's what they don't want to do. Uh, though there is a significant evangelical Christian uh, influence from the United States in particular that's pushing a more American-style form of what I regard as homophobia. As far as my own sort of dealing with these things was concerned, I, I was raised in a, in, a, in a Christian family. We went to Sunday school. It wasn't the kind of... Sunday school that talked much about it. I don't think anyone ever mentioned uh, uh, homosexuality or gayness uh, in, in church, as, I, so far as I can recall the whole time during my childhood. This wasn't one of the things that people were preoccupied with. Um, my, uh, my mother was British, and um, my, I know one of my sister's godparents was a gay man, so I assume she and it was you know, obvious to me, even when I was eight, that he was gay, So even though I didn't really have a very well-developed sense of what that was. So I assumed that uh, my, my parents didn't think that that was an obstacle. Um, but uh, my own dealing with it really came from the kind of Protestantism, evangelical, but in that, this case, I would say progressive evangelical Protestantism, uh, which meant that you took the key thought of the Gospels to be that God loved us. And it seemed to me, as I was working out my sort of own relationship to my sexuality, that if, if I was like this and God loved me, it, you know, the church might not think it was okay, but uh, it couldn't be the case that God didn't. So I actually didn't have too hard a time with this, and I think I was reconciled to my sexuality before, I, as a Christian, before I eventually... Uh, stopped being a Christian, uh, but um, but I but this so this is a sort of lucky story. It turned out well. I think that uh, for people of my generation in Ghana, uh, men and women who were uh, who discover as they grow up that they have sexual desires for their own sex, it was it was it would have been difficult, and many of them would have left. I mean. There's, I think, a million Ghanaians outside Ghana at the moment in Amsterdam and New York and London and Manchester and cities like that around Frankfurt, cities around Europe and the United States. And, um, you know, I suspect that a good number of them are gay people who fled to their cities in the way rural gay Americans f fly to cities because in cities you can find other gay people and also perhaps more tolerance of gay people. But I, I, th I think Ghana will figure this out, people in Ghana like sex too much to think that in the end that it's a bad thing. Uh, so uh, my, my hope is that uh, things will move in the right direction. I think reconciling different dimensions of identity is actually something that people are quite good at. People know how to be gay Mormons. 
They, it's, I mean, the Mormon church isn't so happy that they know how to be gay Mormons, and maybe some gay people don't like the fact that there are gay Mormons, but gay Mormons know how to be gay Mormons. And they know how to be gay Mormon men. They know how to reconcile their gender, their sexuality, and their religion. Uh, my father knew how to be a Methodist, a Ghanaian, a Pan-Africanist, a loyal son of, of the Kingdom of Ashanti, um, a, a father, and you know, all of those things were things that could pull you in certain moments in different directions. Being a loyal Ghanaian meant he had to go to Parliament and leave the family and not spend as much time with us when we were growing up as he might have. Um, being a supporter, being a cosmopolitan supporter of the United Nations meant that sometimes he had to uh, support, uh, he had to be on the side of governments that were opposed to our own government uh, because there are international norms that our own government wasn't respecting and so on. So, you know, people have complex identities, but it's one of the things human beings uh, know how to handle. It's usually other people who make it difficult for you. It's the homophobes who make it difficult for the gay Mormons, or the anti-Mormons who make it difficult for the gay Mormons. Um, and while I don't want to uh, underestimate the, the struggling that goes on in the process of uh, dealing with one's uh, uh, religious identity or one's sexual orientation as one grows up, these are these can be these are challenging difficulties for for young people. Um, usually, the big problems are derived from either what other people do think or what they think other people will think, and which brings us back to our to our main topic because because at the heart of this is a concern to be respected and to be entitled to respect and to be respected as what one is to be respected not in spite of being. Uh, a gay person, or in spite of being a Mormon, or in spite of being a Catholic or a Jew, but as a Catholic or a Jew or a Mormon or a gay person. And uh, one of the things we need to figure out in many of our honor codes is to make them more friendly to all kinds of people who are currently excluded by them. And that's, uh, that's the task, I think, not abandoning honor, but reshaping it to make it uh, supportive of human flourishing both by using collective honor to get people to engage in the moral revolutions that are necessary and by using individual honor to sustain excellence in human lives.